Hello and welcome to Sounds Heal Podcast. I am your host, Natalie Brown, and thank you so much for joining me as we continue to explore the fields of sound healing, sound therapy, and generally the use of sound for health and wellness. Today, our guest is Matab Benton, who was introduced to the gong through kundalini yoga. He's been a kundalini practitioner and teacher trainer for many years. He's also the originator and author of Gong Yoga, as well as a couple other books about the therapeutic use of gong, as well as sound and yoga. Another area of focus for Matab is Vedic astrology. So we explore his background. We get into a lot of talk about the therapeutic use of sound and gong, how it relates to yoga, why the gong, and self-healing with the gong as well, how to get to know your gong and really explore your life and your path using these sound practices. A really wonderful conversation with Matab. It just uh, was so easy, and we really had uh, a wonderful time. This podcast is sponsored by the Ohm Shop and Spa, located in Sarasota, Florida. You can also find them online at theohmshop.com. The Ohm Shop has the country's largest showroom of crystal singing bowls and other vibrational tools. You can see online there are many blogs, learning centers, and all the amazing sound healing products that they offer. I'm also so lucky to be able to teach sound healing workshops there in Sarasota at the Ohm Shop in person several times a year. So please check out all that they are doing. They are wonderful to work with. They will consult with you and really help you find those sound healing vibrational tools that are right for you. So thank you so much to the Ohm Shop and Spa for their support of this podcast. Please enjoy this episode with Matab Benton. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And I'd love to start by looking into uh, your background, you know, what got you into uh, the world of Kundalini Yoga, and of course, its relation to the gong, as well as Vedic astrology, what are some of the highlights that uh, sparked what you do now? Great. Well, yeah, thank you, Dali. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a Kuna Yoga teacher or trainer, and I've been involved with Kuna Yoga since 1973. My first experience of the sound healing or, or the gong was in a uh, ashram in, in Houston, Texas in 1973. I'd just done a class. I was in deep relaxation, and all of a sudden, the sound starts coming to the room I'd never heard before. Uh, it was quite incredible, and I just I could, I had to open my eyes to see what was going on. And the teacher was up front just wailing and beating this big piece of metal. Uh, first time I'd ever heard the gong. And after I got over my initial resistance to the sound, I found it really took me into this place of meditation I'd never been before. It was really quite incredible. So continuing my journey on, I went to live in an ashram in San Rafael in 74. And in that ashram, we were using the gong uh, in a drug recovery program. We were taking in people in a halfway program who were recovering from heroin and cocaine. And part of the program was they would live with us, eat the diet, do the yoga, but also have some sound healing with the gong. And the combination of all this, I suppose, was really quite helpful for people to end these addictive responses. So from that moment forward, I started having this relationship between yoga and healing and sound. And it took a while to gestate. You know, it it did. Uh, For several years after that, I kept doing yoga, but... I never really got back into the gong itself because for one reason I didn't really know much about the gong. I didn't know if I could play it if I had one. I didn't know if we could get one. So, but I kept remembering that memory of how powerful it was. So back in uh, 1993 or 94 or so, uh, my wife and I started teaching Kuna Yoga at our home. Uh, I remembered the gong. I said, you know, this is an amazing instrument. Let's go find one. And we did. And we started using the gong in our yoga classes and our teacher training and our yoga centers. And we found that people would come for the yoga sometime, but they're really coming back for the gong. Uh, it was really the pull for so many people who were looking to change consciousness, to become healthy and healed. And so in my mind, the gong was always an integrated part of the yoga practice and also of healing as well. And that's been my perspective on using the gong. 
Uh, you mentioned astrology, Vedic astrology. It's interesting, I find a lot of people who are into yoga and sound healing also like astrology. Uh, they're all part of this transformational process of discovery. And for me, uh, Vedic astrology gave me another tool to look into sound healing in terms of planetary energies, planetary frequencies, and it just opened another door to explore. So what I love to do most of all actually is to work with people astrologically, uh, yogically, and using sound to, uh, to maybe open up possibilities. And all these go so well together. You know, it's, I find all three uh, seamlessly integrate uh, in my practice and in what people are interested in learning more about. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful um, how that all just built up uh, to what you do now. And, you know, I've heard so many people say that there's actually in, in all yogic paths, there's sound practices. But it Absolutely. seems that, um, you know, Kundalini yoga with the gong may be one of the most well-known uses of sound. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's chanting and mantras as well. But could mm -hmm. you maybe just give a, a brief overview of the use of sound and specifically the gong and Kundalini? What, you know, why is that paired? Mm -hmm. um, so oh, yeah. yeah, a great question. And you're absolutely right. You know, my philosophy is that actually yoga is primarily based on sound. Although in our culture today, we don't normally give it that standing. We think of it as being astas and and breath work, and it is, but you know the original practice of yoga was mantra. The, yoga, the original practices of yoga were sound. The postures and the breath all came later. The sound was the first thing. And the way I see it in terms of why sound is so powerful in the practice of yoga and why, for me, they seem to be almost a necessary pair is that what yoga is about, it's about working with prana, about vital life force and consciousness for healing and for transformation. And there is a direct link between sound and prana. And in fact, if you look at it carefully, you'll find that in some ways, sound is the most uh, subtle carrier of prana, what the yogis call this vital life force energy of the universe. Uh, you know, a lot of times we get prana through our food we eat, we get prana through the sunlight, we get prana through the water we drink. But really the essence of the subtle prana is through the sound we hear. And for me, the, the sound and that carries the prana to a listener is really part of that deep healing process. And so in some ways, for me, it seems like a, such, I guess there's one word that would connect yoga and sound healing or the gong together. That word is definitely, you know, prana in that, in that, that, in that respect. So all the practices of yoga work with cultivating and developing and using prana. And what the gong does, uh, particularly the gong, but any kind of sound instrument, uh, it really enables that uh, the listener or the practitioner to have access to this energy at a more, I call it a subtle level. Uh, I think that's why sound healing is so popular now because people realize, yes, you can take care of the physical body. Uh, you can do all these things we do to take care of ourselves at a certain level. But once you get to a certain point in your journey of healing, uh, you realize one of the most important steps is to work with the energy body and the subtle body that underlies the physical body, which yoga does which sound does quite well. In the old days, when yogis would meditate and go deep into meditation, they would meditate on the inner sounds of the, of the self, and they would hear these sounds developing as they go deeper into meditation. And what the practitioners did, they would start to imitate those sounds with instruments. They would use the flutes, the drums, and uh, even the gongs to kind of emulate or approximate some of those deep sounds the yogis would hear in the deep state of meditation on the way to samadhi. So uh, for me, I, I can't imagine separating uh, sound healing and gongs from yoga. That's, that's my, I guess that's my bias <laughs> in my perspective. But I always tell people, if you want to be a, a better sound healer or get more from sound healing, you really should investigate how to work with your energy, how to work with your prana. And yoga does really well with that. Yeah, yeah and why do you think the gong in well, general, what, you know, why is that such an important part of, you know? Oh my gosh, I know. Um, well, you know, th this, people have said the gong is the source of all sound, you know, that within the gong you can hear every sound there is to hear. All the mantras you can hear in the gong. Um, I think, and if this is really gets into that great understanding of why the sound of a gong is so incredible, so transformational and so healing. And the way I explain it to people who are training with me or just 
people who come to work with the gong therapeutically. It's really all about, in some ways, the sound wave of the gong itself. It, it's, it's very unique. Uh, in fact, the only other instrument that can approximate the sound wave of a gong are the church bells. Uh, multiple church bells ringing can create some of those overtones and complex tones that a single gong can do. You can take one gong and create a, a complexity of combination tones, undertones, overtones with one gong that would, can only be replicated by several church bells ringing at the same time. Uh, and what the sound wave is like, why it's so unique, is uh, it, it, it moves through time differently than uh, most sound waves do. Most sound waves from musical instruments or from the human voice, they have a very predictable linear decay pattern. In other words, when the sound is made by a violin or a drum or a voice, uh, that sound will hit a peak or hit a, right when it initiates, it's usually the peak when you initiate, when you pluck a string or hit a drum, sound is at its highest point, then there's a gradual decay of the sound, and it's pretty linear, it goes straight down, depending on the instrument. It could be like with your breath on a, on a, on a flute, for example, or your uh, drum hitting the drum and have that sound go away. But fundamentally, the sound wave is a very predictable linear decay. And then to get to the next sound, you strike the drum again, you hit this, or you make the guitar string again, you try the piano key again, you get another sound wave that comes out, and then it also decays in that linear fashion. What the gong does, the sound wave is basically like a sine wave. It comes out like a wave. It goes up, it comes down. But as it comes down, it doesn't just keep going down, it starts to return. It's a returning wave that comes back up again and then goes back down again. So it's almost like a kind of like a sinuous kind of snake-like motion that kind of gradually decays over time. But what it does in that sound wave, it, it continues to sustain and last for, depending on the gong, 20 seconds, 40 seconds. So you strike the gong one time, you've got a 35 or 45 second sound wave that's audible. And uh, that's not audible even longer than that, that comes out. You strike the gong again one or two seconds later, you've got a second sound wave coming in that interacts with that, the initial sound wave. You strike it again, another sound wave comes out. So you can have up to probably at least 20 or 30 <clears throat> sound waves of the gong interacting with each other as you play it. And as these sound waves interact, they intersect each other. And like the waves of an ocean, they create different heights of the wave, different troughs, and it starts to create a complexity of sound that honestly, the human ear can't really distinguish or decipher. We think we hear the sound with our ear, but we really hear the sound with our brain. Because as the sound comes in, the brain says, what is all these combination overtone sound? I don't, I don't know what to do with this. I can't, I can't deal with this, right? It's almost like um, someone going to a symphonic orchestra for the first time and they've never heard a symphony played. They're challenged by all the sounds coming in from different instruments. Well, with the gong, just one instrument and one player, you have that same challenge or that delight of discovering this incredible array of sound that's being produced that the ears are trying to do something with, but they just say, brain, take over. Tell, us, tell me what's happening. So consequently, each person hears the sound in a unique way. No two people will hear the gong the same way. It's almost co-created in the moment the gong is being heard and played. So it's a very, uh, it's a very personalized and also, uh, I would say, transcendent experience because what it does, it puts you in your own world of sonic reality. You know, it's like I'm, this, I'm in this place of sound that I've never been before and I can co-create it as I listen to the gong. So that's why I think that gong is such a powerful instrument. Now, singing bowls have some of the same qualities, but not quite. They still have that linear uh, wave when you do the bowls. You get, you get some resonance, of course, and they're great instruments. I'm not trying to dismiss any instrument. But I'm saying that's why, uh, you know, I've, I've tried other instruments and I just say, I only need a gong. <laughs> I can do it all with this gong. And that's why I love it. That's why I love it so much. Yeah, yeah, that's beautifully described. And I, I, I think that's so true. I think that's where that mindfulness and consciousness shift comes from with the gong is what happens after the mallet <laughs> strikes. You know, there's this, this sustain and then fade. And that's really, I think, where a lot of the magic and um, inner inner processing happens yeah absolutely and and i always tell people too it's also when there's no sound there that's also very magical with a gong and uh you know for many people the most profound experience of a gong comes 
the minute after the gong stops playing. You know, that's where it all, that's where it all starts to happen. And so uh, learning how to play the gong in a way that respects the intervals of silence with the sound, and also playing it in such a way that the sound waves don't crash or interfere with that sound, you know, re resonating. So uh, I love the gong because I'll be very honest with you. I, I know I've heard that your background is a musician. I envy you. I tried every musical instrument I could try, piano, guitar, mandolin, clarinet, uh, xylophone. I, I just couldn't make it work. I don't know if I had the discipline or what, but I just couldn't get the musical thing going. But I loved the sound. I got a gong and I started to strike. I thought, wow, I'm making a good sound. I make a good sound the very first time I strike this. And I got really excited about it because I realized that I didn't need to know music to play the gong. It's not, in fact, if you really look at it, I tell people to be, I guess, a little bit controversial. The gong is not really a musical instrument. It's really an instrument of tones. It's a tonal instrument, right? And so you don't play the gong like you would play. You can play it like a musical instrument. Of course you can. You can play it like a musical instrument. You can, you can, you can play it in a symphony orchestra. But fundamentally, what we're doing with the gong is we're going beyond, I think, where music has kept us or led us to over the past four or five hundred years. Where with music, and again, I'm not dismissing music. I, you know, it's beautiful. But the thing about the music and compared to tonal uh, practices like the gong and the er early practices of sound is that with the tonal practices uh, everything is created in the moment and it's not dependent on uh, any particular structure that it has to fit into even harmony or melody and not only that it's not meant to be replicated you know many musicians spend a lot of their lives replicating the compositions of other composers nothing wrong with that I mean it's because it's beautiful right but with the gong, there's no replication. It's all origination. Everything is created in the moment that the gong is played. And consequently, you're playing to the, for the present moment, in the present time, for the present audience, in your present state of mind. And it's quite incredible when you can tap into that. And honestly, I think that's what, what so-called music was like for thousands of years. It was all based on creativity in the moment, uh, working primarily with tones, uh, and uh, that's why I think that's what's missing in our culture today. That's why people, I think, are so hungry for that sound of sound healing. Is that it gives us a new way to be with sound that you know that maybe Western music was failing us in some ways. Yeah, so true, so true. I mean, I, I do have people just getting into sound healing say, well, I'm not a musician, so I don't know, you know. But I think uh, if you are a musician, it really can enhance and perhaps put more intention into what you're offering rather than more uh, being an entertainer. But if you're not a musician, I mean, it's really about intuition. It's about mm -hmm. a spontaneity, creativity, mm -hmm. and maybe even playfulness you know it's a just a beautiful beautiful approach i'm so glad you said that uh, that word intuition absolutely i i tell people the gong is an intuitive instrument I, i'll show you techniques i'll show you how to strike the gong but then i'm going to get out of the way and uh and you should get out of the way too and let and learn everything intuitively and and on, my confession is i've never had a gong teacher in my life really i read a little bit about it from one of the uh, practitioners in kuni yoga who knew some what about the gong but my entire knowledge of the gong came from me playing it uh, for myself and for students for many years. And I'm sure I played it badly for a number of years because no one was telling me anything about it. But the gong is a great teacher. If you learn to listen, if you learn to listen and respond to what you're hearing, you can play the gong really well, uh, much more so than you would expect for not having a musical background. So I think intuition, intuitive playing is absolutely the whole thing about playing the gong. Uh, and I love what you also said about performance is that when you are replicating or playing music, you know, you are a performer, you're performing other people's compositions or maybe your own composition. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and that's a performing art. Uh, but I always tell people, you're not, here, you're, not to, you're not here to entertain people with the gong. You can if you like, you can, you can entertain, of course. But for me, the gong is, a, is somewhat of a sacred instrument of transformation. And if you only play it to entertain, you're, all, you're kind of doing a disservice to the listener and to the instrument itself. There's, there's much more you can do when you kind of shed the shackles of the ego, thinking that you have to uh, impress or create something that, uh, you know, entertains or, or it's performance art, you know. So, again, that's my, that's my bias. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I love what you said about gong. The, the gong is your teacher, you know, and practice is your teacher. 
Um, and it's also quite a reflection of your own energy. If you just kind of lean into it and, and what is the gong telling you, um, you know, a lot can happen there. And that experience is so important. Yeah. I love what you said. You kind of lean into it because, you know, that to, to kind of let go and to trust, you know, and to take away the judgment around what you're doing, because that's a performer. A performer is always judging if they're good or they're bad. And that's not what you're trying to do here. And to go along with that, I'm not saying you have to do yoga to play the gong well, but I will tell you this, you have to be, a, you have to have a relationship to your energy to play it well, be it meditation, be it whatever practice you may do. If you can't relate to your own energy, and if you can't play from an intuitive space, you'll be very limited in what you can do. Not that it's bad, but it's just, it's limiting. So I tell people, if you want to be a great gong player, you really need to have a good practice, not just a gong practice, but also put quotes around the word spiritual. Uh, a spiritual practice or an energy practice that allows you to have that relationship with the goal. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, you know, let's just talk a little bit about um, as far as with this work, you know, initially it was quite personal and then you've written books, you have trainings, uh, you know, I have one of your books right here, Gong Therapy. Um, how did this all develop into, you know, this body of work? And of course you had, um, it's such a building blossoming field. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what you've witnessed along, yeah. along the way building that. Yeah, it's such, so thank you for asking that because this is, uh, it is emerging, it's an emergent thing. And and that's why I started writing a book and writing books about because, you know, a few people were, were doing this as well. Some people were doing trainings as well. But it was mostly self-discovery. People, there really wasn't like a regimen or uh, even a, even necessarily a tradition like there's in yoga. I, I studied Kuna Yoga for many years and for teachers who studied it. And, and there was a tradition there and there's a lineage and a legacy and that was great. I didn't find that with the gongs, not how we play them anyway in the in the Western world. In the Eastern world, yes, you, you know, Indonesia and places like that, absolutely, the gamelan, of course. But as we're playing it for sound healing in the Western world, there really was no lineage, there's no legacy. And what I, my passion is always teaching. I love to teach. And uh, so I, I thought, I, I just want to teach people what I know. And I didn't really know a lot. <laughs> I didn't. And so uh, a lot of what I, I teach is just is from what I discovered. And uh, I don't like to use the word channel because that's such a weird word, word. but it, it was like a download of intuitive thing. Like my Gong Therapy book, it was just, I, I don't say it was completely intuitive, but it's just it's how I felt things should be done. So I just put it out there and people can try it. If it works for them, that's great. You may find another way. And I oftentimes tell people, you know, don't try to play the gong like me or try to play the gong like anyone else. You're going to do yourself a great disservice. Uh, this is a very uh, creative act that is so individualized. That's why it's so exciting that if we get hung up on having to do something a certain way with rigidity and rules, uh, we're going to miss what the gong is trying to teach us. So I've always been kind of a rebel anyway. I always say, you know, no rules, just right, you know, do what feels right for you and all that type of thing. But for the gong, it's quite true. I Sometimes some of my training has been untraining people who felt very intimidated or uh, are in a rigid place with the gong, like, oh, don't hit it that way. Don't hit it here. Don't do that. You must use this kind of handle. You can't play that kind of gong. You have to do it this way. That's a rad, that, those notes don't go together. It's like you have to drop that kind of rigidity around the gong, I think. Uh, you know, so my, my sense is in some ways, uh, I don't know if we need... I guess we need people to teach and train in this, this methodology, and I do that initially. But after a weekend or however long it is, I say, go, just do this. You'll learn over the weeks and months ahead by doing, not by sitting in a classroom with somebody or not trying to imitate someone, but just uh, it's discovery. And I love that about the goal. Yeah. That's a really well, important note. Yeah, and just um, explore. Explore it for yourself. What's right for you might not resonate with with someone else but that's the beautiful beautiful part about it yeah and i think the gong the other lovely thing about the gong i think that's so great is that when you play the gong it does awaken intuition itself because it, it works a lot on the higher energy centers uh it, it gets you in a very neutral space so that's why i love it it's like it is a teacher but it also prepares you to learn more about it as you play it and that's why i love writing books and i love doing trainings and i'll continue to do so 
but ultimately I think we're in we're in this new era, this Aquarian approach to I think music too, where it is also about group consciousness, where something is created in the moment for the group that you're with, and 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 for healing too. It's for healing, and so um, all these things work work quite well <clears throat> together. And then my other passion <clears throat> is making it more part of a yoga practice. I you know I, I do a book called Teaching Gong Yoga, which is basically about how do you apply sound during the practice of yoga? Not just, I always joke, you know, the gongs aren't just for relaxation anymore. They're, uh, they, can be, they can be used, utilized in almost any type of uh, spiritual practice during the practice itself, you know, with asanas, with pranayam, chanting mantras with the gong. Uh, all these just, uh, they complement each other quite well. And even taking it beyond yoga, using the gong and other healing modalities. I, I, I teach and train people who uh, use the gong with acupuncture, uh, chiropractic, uh, Reiki work, uh, you, you can almost just name any, any um, alternative or complementary healing modality and I can tell you about people who are finding ways to integrate the gong into those modalities and so it's really so open-ended it's like I, I don't want to put it in a box because it can really uh, do so much in so many places in that way yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah, two questions from that, you know, with this blossoming field, and you've really experienced um, a lot of this emergence of, of, of course, yoga, sound healing, the gongs, there's new people coming into it all the time. Mm-hmm. Why do you think it is so important right now, just as a collective, as individuals, and kind of this um, multitasking, dense time that we live in? And also, what with new people coming in, what do you think it's important for them mm-hmm. to have an awareness of as they enter this field? Yeah, I think we have a new opportunity here to uh, create something that hasn't been created before uh, in terms of uh, tradition, lineage, and, um, and the way things are being held. Like, you know, yoga, for example, that's, that's a very old tradition, hundreds, thousands of years, and, and it's worked very well, and it's fantastic, and I love it. And there are lineages of it and all that. And people get, sometimes they say, well, I do Hatha yoga, I do Kuni yoga, I, I do Ashtanga yoga. And that's great too. But ultimately what I think we're trying to do here with this field, I don't want to start putting it into categories and boxes for people as much as we have done in the past. And that's why I, you know, I myself, I've actually resisted, <laughs> if that's the right word, uh, training with other gong trainers. I mean, I, I know about them. I, I, I respect their work. I, I hear about them. But I, my feeling is I want to have this come from within myself. And I want the player to feel that too when they're experiencing it as well. So I think we have an opportunity here as new people come in, there's a temptation for people to gather into uh, groups and cliques and categories and traditions and follow teachers and you know, all this type of thing that humans do, you know? We do that. Uh, but I, I think for me, I think this is a chance for self-initiated uh, transformational practices with the gong and I hope we can hold it that way and I think the other thing I'm very adamant about is if you don't have a spiritual practice don't play the gong for me and I don't say that as a snob or anything like that but the gong is so powerful sound healing is so powerful that unless the practitioner has done the work on themselves I don't think they should be doing it for other people I think that's what's really key not about training how to do chords or keys or scales on a piano that's training right but the self-training, the self-discipline you have to have, I think, to really utilize this, this technology of sound healing effectively, it's going to be entirely dependent upon the person who's doing it because all sound healing does in a gong is it takes the, the energy of the player or the healer and it transmutes that energy into sound. It turns your energy into sound. And, the, and that's the way the person can receive your energy is through the sound. It's like the massage therapist using their hands on your body. And so if you're not a very, what's the right word, a very uh, uh, conscious person, uh, it's going to come across in your playing. It's going to come across in how people feel after they hear you play. And so I, I think I'd rather have uh, a somewhat inexperienced gong player who has a great practice than someone who's been playing for dozens of years who has no practice. Because that, it's, like, <laughs> it's like going out and having, having a food, a, a restaurant meal, right? Uh, you can, you know, if you go to a restaurant and order a really nice meal and it's really fancy and it's very expensive and you eat the food and you go, that didn't digest very well. It, was, it looked good, it tasted good, but it kind of felt, ooh, afterwards, didn't digest too well. Well, the person in the kitchen who made it for you probably didn't love you. They just made food for whatever, it's a transaction. Then you have a meal someone loves you who makes it digest well. So I, I think that may be an overstretching metaphor, but 
I think it's important when you're doing sound healing work and you're playing a gong or whatever you're playing, that you're doing it from the highest place of possible of consciousness because at that point in time, all the barriers are down between you and another person. Your energy is just coming, it's pouring right into them. I mean, and they can't even hold it. You know, it's like it's really surrounding them. So uh, that would be my primary requirement to, to play the gong is, is you, 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 I, in, in my opinion, you must have a disciplined practice where you work on yourself. Otherwise, just play for yourself and have fun with it. But don't play for other people. <laughs> That's a great distinction. You know, there is a discipline there, but it's also, you know, getting out of the analytical mind and am I doing it right? And what's the proper technique? And actually just leading from your heart and, and from your spirit. So, yeah, I appreciate the yeah, distinction. I, yeah. I call, it the inner, I call it the inner gong player, right? The inner player. And, uh, and if I can kind of take a little sideways turn here with you a little bit, one of the things that I'm kind of recently discovering that I'm becoming more, I guess, passionate about is playing the gong for yourself. Because, you know, we think of sound healing as something we do for other people, and, and we do. And for many, many years, I just played the gong for other people at the end of a yoga class or, you know, a relaxation session or whatever, and I played the gong for them, and I loved it. But then I said, you know, I should play this for me too. Because what happens in the moment of playing the gong or any, I guess, sound healing instrument is that the player and the healer and the patient or the client become one and the same. And what happens is you play something like this, you start to change the way you're playing in response to how you're receiving and healing from the playing. So I think it's a magnificent way of self-healing and uh, as a, as a, even as a uh, daily practice, if you like to just sit down sometimes for five or 10 minutes and just play the gong like you want to play it. Not, not with an idea you're gonna get better at it or you're gonna try a new trick out or a technique, but just say, you know, I'm just gonna let the gong heal me and I'm just gonna play for my own healing. And the gong will do it. I mean, it will come through for you. And I think that's one of the things that I think is one of the next steps here is uh, letting people know, you may never play the gong for anybody else but yourself, but that's enough, it's enough. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of moving toward this type of idea of training in that way, where you just do it with this ideal that it's about your own self journey, of, your own journey of self transformation. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah, one of one of my favorite things to do. Just sit, <laughs> sit with the gong. Sit with the gong. Yeah. Absol absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's funny. People always ask me, like, you know, because I obviously I do have a lot of gongs. I and I. Thankfully, I have a wife who puts up with a person who has 50 gongs. Uh, our house is full of gongs. And she says, do, 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 will you ever get enough gongs? I think, I think I'm almost there because if I have too many more, I can't ever play them all, and that's not right. You know, I want to be able to make the sound. But the reason I, I fell in love with the gongs at that level was I realized that every gong, even the same type of gong, has a different sound, a different personality. It's like, it's like kittens or babies or whatever. They're all very different, even though they might you know, have some similarities. And so people say, well, what gong should I get? You, you got a lot of gongs. What gong should I buy? And how, how do I pick out a gong? And, and th I think that's a great question is like, you know, how do you, or any sound healing instrument, right? And sometimes people get really, again, like you said, analytical about it. They think, well, uh, you know, maybe I should do one that has a certain frequency because I heard it works on a certain chakra or a certain planet or you know, and we get in the head trip about this a lot of times because we, we don't, that's how we make a lot of decisions sometimes. We try to an, analyze or do research or get other people's opinions and then try to do something. Uh, you, you really aren't buying a gong to heal other people as much as you're buying a gong or sound healing instrument to heal yourself. So my advice for people is don't, don't read too much about what a gong is supposed to do before you buy it. <laughs> it's just someone else's opinion. That's all it is. And what you're going to find out is when you play it, you'll discover what it does. And if you have the opportunity to hear a gong or to ideally play a gong and then make your choice that way, you'll be so happy. Now you can listen online, you can get a good vibe. And so I would suggest if you don't have the luxury of being around lots of gongs and trying them out and playing them, maybe at least, uh, at least listen to the gongs online where you get to and just say, don't even think about what gong it is or even what size it is or what it is. Just say, I love the way that gong sounds. That's the way you pick a gong, right? Because if you like the sound, it's going to be your friend. I, I joke, it's like, you'd be like getting married to someone whose voice you hated. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, I mean, her voice is driving me crazy. It's like, right. <laughs> it's like if you don't like the sound of your own gong, you're not going to be very good with it. 
So I think that is the key in, in picking a gong. And I wish I could tell you, well, I could look at your chart and tell you should buy a mercury gong or, you know, or this is the best frequency for healing the, the crown chakra or whatever. And, and I can certainly do that because I have fun doing that. But honestly, I don't think it's quite fair. Uh, I think in some ways it, it really is about uh, trusting that if you show up with, a, with an open heart and open mind, the gong will probably select you anyway and probably find you somehow in that way. Right, right, yeah. Do you like how it sounds and, and how does it make you feel rather than what absolutely. you read about it? Yeah, that's yeah, it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of like dating online and then you go meet the person in person you go, oh my God, this isn't all like you were online. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's so different, you know. So, <laughs> so that's one thing that can be helpful. Uh, and then on the other hand, sometimes, you know, like anything, it takes time to make friends uh, with an instrument too. And I've had people who, who bought a gong said, you know, I just don't really like this gong. I just bought it and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, I made a mistake. I, I should probably send it back. I say, well, look, just be okay with it for a while. Just play it for a while. Try it again. Stay with it for a while. Because what happens, every instrument, even something that looks almost exactly the same, has a different response to how you play. And it's almost like you have to find the right spots to play in the right way to strike. And, and it's, all, it's a little different all the time. So just because you can play a gong does not mean you can pick up the next gong and play it well. I, say, I, I know I have a friend who bought a, a large gong, 42 inches. And he says, I've had this for six months. I still don't know how to play it. I'm still figuring this out. And he says, this may take years. I say, yes, it might, it might take years because it's such a complex gong. It's got so many layers to it. So sometimes, uh, you know, the gongs do demand that we also put the time in to, to learn how they need to be played. So, uh, so I always say a little patience with the new gong sometimes. Uh, even, if you, even if you like the way it sounded online and you get it at home, you go, oh gosh, this could be a bad mistake. Uh, just relax and let, let yourself get used to how the gong wants to be played. It's good advice, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, there's so many different mallets that if you have one gong, it, it could actually sound like you have 20 gongs depending on the, the mallet. That's a whole nother story. Yeah. Oh, I, I, you're going to get me started down the track. You probably don't need to go down now. Because <laughs> I, I, I was, I have to, here's an honest admission. I'm, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say it. For many years, I thought you had to use one mallet and one gong. And I did that for a number of years because I didn't have anyone showing me anything differently. I didn't know. So I had my one mallet, same mallet I used on, on the gong, same gong for a number of years. And it taught me a lot. Then one day a friend came to play the gong and he had this little bag and I said, what's in the bag? He said, mallets. I said, well, I have a mallet. He said, no, I have lots of mallets. I said, I, was I said, this isn't golf. You don't need like a, a mallet for every different, you know, gong. Oh yeah, he said, yes, you do. And he started playing. I thought, oh my God, that gong, it sounds so different with that mallet. And so now I tell people, and this is quite honest, I'd rather have one gong and three mallets instead of three gongs and one mallet. Seriously, because the mallets are the missing, I think the overlooked story in gong players, at least for people who are starting out. They'll buy a gong and then people say, they say, and the mallet's like an afterthought. Like, oh, well, I got this gong and they, should, they say I should this gong because it goes with that mallet and whatever. This mallet goes with that gong. and Or they give me the mallet free and or whatever, you know? And it's like, are you kidding me? Because the mallet is, is I think it's just as, probably as, as important as the gong itself. And so uh, I told people, don't cheap out on the mallet. Uh, in fact, you should probably go ahead and buy two or three. You'll never be sorry you have more than one mallet. Just buy a gong and then buy two or three. I know you feel like you spend a lot of money and you want to eat, you want to like, you know, save money. Don't save money on your mallets. Buy two or three. I think everyone should probably have, when I play the gong, I would, I would feel lost without at least five mallets. And I'm always picking them up and using them. And, and I couldn't even imagine not having them. So uh, that's the big thing. And the other thing that I learned late in my life, which I, I think people are probably not having to do now because they are watching people play the gong more and more, I thought you only could only use one mallet at a time because in the in Western world, symphony orchestras, that's usually what they do. They take a big mallet, hit the gong one time. And so that's how they were sold and marketed for so long. And, um, and then I realized, you know, it's like a drum. You can use two mallets. This was a number of years ago. And from that moment on, my gong playing accelerated by quantum leaps because now I can make so many levels. And I, I'm, I'm probably telling people these things that people already know now, but that was my journey of discovery was like, one gong, one mallet. <laughs> and then, you know, then uh, one gong, many mallets. And then many gongs and many mallets, right? So uh, there's so many things you can do uh, with a gong, depending on the mallets that you use. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
Well, there's one other aspect that we haven't talked too much about. I mean, you were talking about, you know, creating a discipline, a spiritual practice. I'm kind of curious uh, a little bit more about Vedic astrology and how that fits in to mm-hmm. someone kind of finding their their life path, their their spirit spirit path, their dharma, perhaps. Right. Um, you know, it is a part of what you do. So, do you just want to mention anything about that aspect of your work? Yeah, that's so fun. Um, you know, most people I do Vedic astrology for are sound healers or yogis or people who are already kind of in that realm. And I, I and the reason they are is that all these things, all these uh, things we're talking about, astrology and yoga and sound healing and energy work and all those things uh, in astrology, they say they're in, the, they're in the same area of the chart. They're in the same house. They're in the same area of life. So people are interested in one of these, oftentimes they're very much attracted to the other, right? So there's that commonality that they have. And so when I look at this, when you look at Vedic astrology, particularly as it compressed into Western astrology, uh, a lot of that astrology is about Dharma. It's about, uh, also it's about the karmas. It's about uh, what you're here to do. And I can look at people's charts and say, you know, you have a really good chart for working with sound uh, or for working with uh, percussion or rhythm. Uh, there are actually certain places in a chart that actually indicate uh, people who are even good gong players. Seriously. Now, I wouldn't tell people that they can't be a gong player because it's not that way in their chart. But when you see that some people's chart, you can say, do you like music? Uh, do, you, do you play an instrument? And they say, I thought about it. Say, well, you probably should try it out because in your chart, you have a great capacity for uh for using music or for, for using instruments and um uh, and also you have a good capacity for healing and for one-on-one work and you can also have a really great ability to uh, meditate so you can see these things in a chart that really are part of what we're talking about in terms of you know sound healing and because sometimes you know, i get a lot of people saying i want to change my job i got this career i hate <laughs> and and they say what can I, what am i good at doing and then you start opening up and saying well you know you'd actually be really good working like in a retreat-like or environment. You'd be really good uh, at working one-on-one with people. You'd be very good at counseling or advising people or teaching. And they think, wow, that's not me now. I'm just like working in a bank. But I can really do these other things too. I say, yeah, absolutely. And so in some ways, it gives them permission to kind of utilize these uh, talents, these gifts that they haven't really um, activated yet. So that's one thing astrology does. It, it really reminds you of your gifts, your talents, uh, and your abilities. And so I always tell people I like to confirm and affirm for them with a reading. It's like, okay, I can, I can confirm uh, this about who you are. And I can also affirm that what you're desiring is actually in alignment with who you are. So that's kind of exciting to see that. You know, and there's some people who probably, you know, maybe they aren't meant to work with sound, and that's okay too. They they have other uh, callings and other dharmas in life, but Vedic astrology does give you a good insight, I think, into uh, into the karmas that you're working through in this lifetime, um, what the best path may be for you to take, uh, even some of the best avenues for meditation, perhaps, um, you know, and then usually it does show a capacity for, uh, uh, I call it musical instruments, you know, working, making, work, using the hands to make sound, you can see that in the chart too. So yes, it's, you can certainly use it that way. Um, and you can also uh, use it in terms of maybe working with people who are, uh, need sound healing, for example. That's, I think I find that even more beneficial than if, if so if I was doing a therapy uh, a session for somebody and I looked at their astrological chart, I could see they had like a real uh, thing about uh, insecurity or maybe about self-trust or Maybe there's something there, uh, uh, some underlying anxiety or depressive, depressive tendencies, right? Especially, and you say, oh, okay, I can see, you can kind of see that. So maybe I would play this instrument in a certain way to, let's say depression, for example. You can see there's some things in the chart related to the moon and your emotions and that can indicate uh, chronic or mild depression. So as an example, so perhaps I saw that. It's okay, let's, let's play the gong or whatever instrument you're gonna play let's play it to activate energy in other words to get energy moving rather than trying to sedate like if you have anxiety then you might want to try to sedate with the music or the healing but if you have depression you want to activate so with the gong i start to play a little faster maybe a little louder to get energy moving to kind of snap out of that depressive state so i, I do see that and it's not just astrology if you have other modalities like you know 
people who do acupuncture, or chiropractic, or cranial sacral healing, they have the same type of tools they can use to say, oh, I can feel the body, I can feel what's going on here that needs some attention. And then they use their sound healing uh, based on their diagnosis. So I, I do think you can use it as a diagnostic. And I think people who have other uh, trainings in other areas, uh, you can you can diagnose. I think that's one thing about sound healing that sometimes that is a little tricky. Like, you know, unless your intuition is really good, uh, you might not know how to play for, especially for a one-on-one. And uh, so diagnostic tools like astrology uh, can be very helpful to uh, give you pointers which way to go with that. And that way, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so they're all good. And then, of course, there's the planetary gongs. <laughs> gongs are even singing bowls now. I think they're instruments that are tuned to what they're calling planetary frequencies. <clears throat> and, you know, and I, I love them. I have many of them, and I use them a lot. Uh, I love astrology, and I haven't still quite, in my own mind, fully came come to realize what is real about that. Is it because it's a Mars gong? Does it have bring you Mars energy, or is it the frequency of that gong that brings you the Mars energy, or is it the way that I play it because it is a Mars gong that brings you that healing? Right? I, I don't think we really know. <laughs> so I mean, and, and some people are really. Uh, frequency freaks. They, they, they think it's all about the frequency. And I will agree, I, I definitely agree, that frequencies have different effects on you. Uh, the thing is, they can have different effect on different people. So the same frequency could affect me differently than you. So to prescribe something about frequency is a little tricky because, as I said, whoever receives that frequency is also interacting with it. So it's not just like, you know, we give you a pill or a frequency and you're going to be well. It's like, is this frequency working for you? So, nevertheless, I think frequencies are important. I have my fa- I have my favorite frequencies, <laughs> you know. Like I love this F sharp that I got. I, I love this you know I love this gong that's like you know uh, what's the frequency of it? I was just trying to I, I forget sometimes it was a, a one one oh eight. I, anyway, I have frequencies that I love personally and I play it. So they are important, but to to kind of like put everything as a frequency, everything as frequencies, uh, it's nice. It's analytical. It's very, uh, it's very secure and, and good feeling that you can just take a number and, and do something. Uh, but I think, again, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're looking too narrow at something, you know. And I had a great story. I, uh, a really good gong maker in Germany, Martin Blas, who makes these amazing gongs, he was telling me this story about gongs he made for people. And he made these two gongs, and he actually made them the same frequency because that's what he was working with. And, Someone came to, to be played, and he played the gong. He played both gongs, and one person said, you know, that gong you played, this did nothing for me. The other gong you played, I feel healed. Same frequency. And what it was, it wasn't the frequency. It was the, the way the gong was resonating, or uh, it was something was going on in the layers of sound beneath the frequency that was creating that shift <coughs> in the listener. So if we, if we only use frequency as a determinant of how something is going to work, it's 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 just it's too simple you just can't go there that's what i'm thinking right right i'm glad you i'm glad you said that right it's uh it's very personal and it's also moment by moment how how it affects you so yeah i'm so glad you you uh out of that aspect because no it's not it's not a sound pill a free frequency pill one size fits all yeah if it was that we could just go on you know on on the internet or youtube and play the frequency pit and you put on the headphones and see that feels great but it's not that. It's, it's part of that. It's always, it is part of it. I agree. Mm-hmm. It's part of it. But it's not, it's not all, of, all of that. So, um, and again, that's why I, I love this field is because I think that's my passion. Let's just let's keep this open. Um, let's not try to close it in. At the same time, let's have standards so that when people have a sound healing experience, they don't walk away feeling, you know, attacked or, or uh, abused or, 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 or deceived or whatever the word might be. Because I, 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 that is, if I have a concern about that, and I really should, I think it'll be self-correcting anyway. I shouldn't be too concerned because I think it's self-correcting over time. <clears throat> you know, it's like bad yoga teachers. A bad yoga teacher eventually gets found out. <laughs> but it would be nice if, if there were either standards or some, like techniques even. Like I can tell people, do not strike the gong like this because I don't care how great a player, I don't care what your intu- intuition is like. If you strike like this, it's going to be a, a, a bad, crashy sound that's going to really hurt the nervous system. And that is a rule. 
And so there are there are certain techniques or standards that you have to have in place, I think, in anything you're doing, even you know, teaching yoga or sound healing or whatever you're doing, that there's some things that the do's and the don'ts a little bit, but I think where we get into trouble is where it becomes like a rigid, uh, a, a regimented uh, discipline that it's just because of one person's vision that they're imposing on everybody else. So it's a tricky place to walk here, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To do that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, you already mentioned that you're, you're getting more into kind of this, this newer discovery of, oh, I should really be introducing for myself and, and teach others to use the gong for, for self healing. And I, I'm just curious, what else is kind of coming forth right now? What are you discovering, uh, curious about? Yeah, uh, it's so funny. Uh, I, I didn't think this was going to happen, but, you know, I, I never really used handheld gongs too much that you could carry around because I like the big sound of the big gongs. I just loved them. And then the last, what, last year or so, a year and a half, <clears throat> two years, I started to really get into these. And I thought, and, and here's why. It's really uh, about group consciousness. You can give everybody a handheld gong and you can play them with each other. And it's fun. It's a celebration. In fact, this is how they're used a lot in, uh, in, well, in Korea, for example, in, other, in, 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 in Thailand. Uh, everyone has their handheld gong, and they're out playing in, in festivals and celebrations and in group energy and meditation. And it's, that's where I really got the uh, image that, you know, this gong is also about creating group consciousness. I mean, even when you hear the one gong as a group, you have a group consciousness because of that one gong. So there's a group consciousness that develops from just hearing the gong. But how exciting that you can also create group consciousness by having groups of people all playing their own gong. And the handhelds are nice because they're inexpensive. You could probably buy a half dozen yourself and just pass them out to your friends and, uh, and you could play together. Uh, also for children, this is a great way to get kids learning how to work with sound and having fun because it's, it should be fun first. So I, I'm really getting excited about handheld gongs and I'm, and I'm, I'm hoping that over time the gong makers, when I say gong makers, people who are making really amazing uh, larger gongs, uh, I think they need to make amazing small gongs. And, uh, and making a small gong is sometimes harder than making a large gong. <laughs> you know, to, to get that purity of that great, deep, sustaining sound. You can make them that way. They, they just haven't normally done it too much because it's expensive. Or, But my feeling is is that I think that's, I think that's something that uh, I see it on the horizon, this idea of having small gongs uh, for more people and playing in groups and, uh, and in fact I'm doing a training of that just next uh, Sunday uh, to do oh, that fantastic more. because yeah. I, I think it's just it's just another way to open up for myself uh, discovery and so uh, I think that's why as much as we can let's just keep everything uh, evolving and, and discover because I feel like and again I'm getting a little off here but I'm sure I'm sure your listeners won't mind if I kind of share my my, my strange woo-woo vision <laughs> <laughs> where this is going is that you know I think the gongs we have today there's never been any like that before in the world and when I say the gongs we have today these really interesting well made and I call them European gongs or Western gongs that are made from a different type of metal a different type of production process that creates these different layers and subtleties of sound that really weren't available only in the really expensive or large Eastern gongs of the past so, you know, it was, wasn't really accessible to very many people. But now gongs are being made that for under $1,000 or whatever money it is, you can have an instrument that would have been priceless uh, 100, 200 years ago. It would have been unavailable. You couldn't even have it. And so now we have access to sound healing instruments, and I'm thinking particularly the gong, that was never there before. It's almost like they were showing up. It's like they're part of like the emissaries of the new age. It's like... There's a new way to be, there's a new way to heal, there's a new way to experience consciousness, and we're going to be carrying it forward for you. Now, other things to do besides gongs, right, obviously. But that's why I feel like the gongs are, they're here. And they're not, they're not necessarily sentient beings, I don't think they're sentient, but I think they're, I think they're hugely karmic. I think there's a reason that they are here in the way they're here, and the way they're available to us now. And, um, and I tell people too that you don't really own a gong. You only get to take care of it for a while because the gongs will outlive us. They will. They can live hundreds of years. And the gongs that are being made today will, will probably pass them down for generations. And they're gonna think, wow, this is like, this is like the, you know, it's like the ring of a, in the Hobbit, right? Or the Lord of the Rings. It's like, this is a precious thing that had, that carries sound and healing 
through the centuries, through the years. So I tell people, yeah, invest in cryptocurrency if you like, but as far as I'm concerned, I put some more money into some good gongs. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because that, that to me is, that is value. So, uh, so I, I do see that we're, in some ways, people who are using gongs, people who are into sound and healing, uh, we're being entrusted with something that we don't want to mess up. And so, uh, you know, and I even I even tease people about, and I, listen, I, I can understand why, but I tease people and say, you mean you won't let anybody else play your gong but you? No, I can only play the gong. Say, you're going to be in trouble because someday you're going to be dead. Someone's going to play that gong. But, but I'm joking because they, they're thinking that somehow if someone else plays a gong, it will hurt the vibrations of it. I tell them the gong is more powerful than that. The gong can clear so powerfully, there's nothing you could do to a gong. Maybe, I guess if you're Satan, you could do something bad to a gong. But by and large, no one can really, and you could hit it with a hammer and destroy it, absolutely. But if you're worried about someone's vibes, you know, messing up your gong, don't worry, the gong clears it almost immediately, you know? It, it, it's, it's, it just clears everything so quickly. And you don't need to smudge a room if you have a gong. You don't need to smudge, you got a gong. The gong's gonna clear all that energy more than anything else can. Sound is more potent than smoke. So, uh, so I, I, that's why I say you should have a gong in your home, because even when you're not playing the gong, the gong is continually clearing the space for you. Uh, in the old days, they, always, they had said, even the sight of a gong could heal a person. And what they meant by that was, when you get close enough to a gong, the healing energy is starting to be felt. So I guess maybe this way we should kind of perhaps end this, because I know we're getting close to our time, but uh, when you strike a gong, the molecules vibrate. The metal, the molecules of the metal vibrate, and you know, and people who work with study metal and study molecular vibration, they've done these studies. They've they've watched how molecules will come into a vibration or frequency when metal is activated, and they they, they determine the half life of that vibration. Like, okay, it's, there's, the molecules are still vibrating, but only half as much as they were back then, and they keep looking at it, only half as much as they do back then. It's like radioactive material, right? Half lives. What they did with like the metal and the gong when they strike it, they say. The molecules are always going to be holding that little bit of vibrational frequency for up to 40 years after the gong is struck. So in your house, you've got a gong that was struck at some level, unless you dampen it or do something to the vibration or something to like stop it, you've got this molecular vibration going on in the environment continually. So that's magic. To me, that's magic. So if you want magic, get a gong. A gong in every home. That's your vision. A gong in every I, 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 a gong in every home, and also a drive-through gong temple that you can just drive through and they'll gong you on the way to work. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Absolutely. It's needed. It is needed more than yeah. ever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. yeah. Well, well, thank you for giving me the chance to talk about what I love so much. I have great passion for it. I know you have great passion for this too. I hope those of you who are listening today have your passion even stronger after hearing this. And as I tell people when I train them. Play the gong and heal the world. Mm. That's what I like to say. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your for your passion, for for living your passion as well and, and sharing it uh, so authentically. Uh, I really appreciate you. Thank you, Natalie. Something on. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Sound Heal Podcast, sponsored by the Ohm Shop and Spa. And keep up to date with what's coming up next at soundshealstudio.com. Check things out on Facebook at Sounds Heal Studio. And you can listen to all previous podcasts as well as music meditations on the YouTube channel at Sounds Heal Studio. Be well and stay tuned. <laughs>